we're going to try to make it a little further this time. Amen. Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuance. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking commandment, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. This is what a riddle, right? We're going to break down this riddle today. For if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Let's read this together. Uh, verse 25. There it is. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. In Spanish, gracias doy a Dios por Jesucristo Señor nuestro. Así que yo mismo con la mente servo a la ley de Dios. Amen. I had to let the Lord work out the translation. <laughs> the Lord knows my heart. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, I want to just talk about the law of the mind. Uh, the law of the mind. Let's lift up our hands and let's just ask God to speak to us. Lord, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for the journey um, that we are on together. I pray that your work can just go forth with power and clarity and that you would just speak to us and minister to us and give us understanding of your word. You are the vine and you, we are the branches. Bless us tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, I know the riddle is uh, very interesting um, for us to consider because this is what you call real life writing. I know we have what we call real life preaching, uh, but this is that real life writing uh, because what Paul is displaying as a Christian, as someone who is anointed by God, as someone that knows the commandments of God, someone that has seen visions from God, someone that heard the voice of God, uh, someone that had experienced miracles by God, uh, 
He's speaking to the church in Rome, these Jews and Gentiles. He's speaking to them saying that although I'm anointed, I still wrestle. Hmm. I thought somebody was going to run right there. I thought somebody was just going to. He said, although I'm anointed as a Christian, I'm still in a fight. I'm in a battle to obey. Everybody say obey. I'm in a battle to try to obey God's commandments because my flesh really doesn't want to. I've seen visions from God, but when it comes to obedience, he's saying, I want to do right. Ah, come on, somebody. Everybody, now everybody going into hiding mode in this message. That's so interesting. Everybody's looking at me like, Pastor, you by yourself in that struggle. That's, that's, just, that's just you and Paul. Hello. Uh, he's saying that this law of God has exposed within me that I have a problem. The commandments and the writings of the scriptures has revealed in me I got some issues. And everybody in here, I'm about to burst somebody's bubble. You, my friend, got some issues. What, what lets me know that we all have issues? Um, the law. Uh, the word. Uh, the word exposes to us that we are carnal, sold under sin, and the only way that we're going to have obedience to God is there has to be something on the outside and on the inside that's helping me to live this out. Because I cannot live this out from my own motivation or from my own ability or my phenomenal willpower. Uh, sin has exposed that I may have carnal willpower, but I do not have spiritual willpower unless God helps me to have spiritual willpower. Amen. Amen. You can go to work for eight hours, but it's tough to pray 20 minutes. What does that show you? That shows you that your flesh is willing, but your spirit, come on somebody, your spirit is weak. And you can spend eight hours working and it's like it went by like that. But you spend 15 minutes praying and you're like, man, I'm hungry. <laughs> you start thinking of everything, especially if you pray at your house. You start opening up the fridge for no reason. 20 minutes of praying, you don't open up that refrigerator 15 times. for no. It's the same thing in there. You're drinking ginger ale, and then you open up, you drink some milk, then you open up, you eat a grape, and then you... <laughs> Anything to not focus on prayer. Why? Your spirit is willing, but this body, this flesh, wants to just do what it wants. And if that is you, if you have been in a struggle in the flesh and trying to please God... Paul is saying, you're not alone. See, there's some uh, writers that try to justify Paul speaking, and they try to say, well, Paul is talking about before he was ever saved. No, he's not talking about before he was saved. He's talking about while he's saved, while he's faithful, while he's coming to church, while he has a prayer life, while he's ministering and helping others. He's saying, listen, I'm still in a battle. And I've still got to keep this flesh under subjection because if, if the flesh has its way, on Sunday, I look like I'm saved. Come on, somebody. On Monday night, I'm ready to hurt somebody. And, and, and what he's saying as a Christian, he's saying, I'm walking in an endless fight, an endless contradiction within me. Because on Sunday, when I'm gathered around people, I feel real spiritual. But when I'm alone at home, 
Somebody just clap. Somebody just clap. Somebody just clap. When I'm alone at home, it's like when I'm when when, when I'm at church, I'm, I'm safe. I'm like I'm like a spiritual superhero. I go home, I turn into Clark Kent. Okay. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Now, now we don't know who superheroes are. Y'all, y'all funny. Y'all funny right now. Somebody looking at me like Clark Kent. Let, 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 me, let me break it down. You, 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 you Spider-Man at church. Come on, somebody. Go home. You put your glasses on. You're Peter Parker. Yo, okay. Oh, oh, okay. All right. All right. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Oh, you Batman at church. You Bruce Wayne at home without the money. <laughs> What I, what I, what I, what am I, <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? What, what I'm saying here is, is that when we are surrounded by others that are worshiping and praising, it, it, we, we are, we, the spirit is strong. But, but it's when we're at home and when we're in those private moments and when we got that computer screen and we got that monitor and we got that phone open, come on somebody, that the images start getting your attention and it can sway the flesh away from what you got in your spirit. And so this is why church is important. This is why coming to church is important. Because you need to be around people that are imperfect but on the journey toward their future, toward Jesus Christ. Because we strengthen one another to say, hey, you're not alone in this fight. Paul, Paul struggled. You struggle. But if we can link up together and go towards God together... Woe to the one that's alone when he falls. But if there's two, if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand. Amen. Amen. And so, and so that's why gathering together is important because we see you're not alone in this journey. And that's what the devil wants to make you believe. He wants to believe that you're the only one that's ever had a fight in your mind. Ooh, a fight in the mind. You ever fought in, in the mind that you said, I, I'm, I'm going to be spiritual forever. Uh, but in the weak moment, come on, with the, with, with the breakup, come on, with the loss in a family, with, with the situation, with the unexpected bills, whatever it is, you had the weak moment, and what happens? You resort to your default. The flesh. Everyone say the flesh. The flesh. And it was a guy. This is this is his real name. His name is Sherwood Lienfelter. He's not a superhero. Sherwood Lingenfelter, he wrote a book about leading cross-culturally. And he talked about the challenge when you're leading a community of believers to God that he said that when you're trying to lead a community to be faithful to the word of God where you develop a kingdom community where the word of God and the presence of God is the priority. He said what happens is there will be progress. But he said in a moment of crisis, he said many times in a moment of crisis, people begin to revert back to their default culture. And he said when people revert back to their default culture, that's what causes problems. Where it's not the kingdom culture, but our default cultures. And, and what Paul is saying here is that all of us have a default culture. And, and what is that default culture? We were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. That's our default. Right? 
And when we're all saying, let's be spiritual, let's love, let's, let's, and that's good, but it's in the weak moments of crisis that tests how much you got that on the inside of you. Right? So, he talks about with the Jews that, that, I'm not echoing, am I? I, I felt that, yeah. Yeah, I, I heard, I preached and then I heard my, I heard something preach back to me. I f <laughs> felt it in my side right there. I was like, okay. <laughs> what shall we say then? Is the lost sin, God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Here's what he's speaking of. The revelation of the law breeds a responsibility to obey the law. So you, so you don't know. Am I still echoing? I'm echoing like, okay. I'm going to dial it back. Hello. That's as much as I can dial it back. I'm sorry. With revelation comes responsibility. Everyone say responsibility. So when there is a law that is given, that law is expected to be obeyed because once you, once it is said to you, you this is wrong. Now you have the understanding that this is wrong. So if you do it still, although it's wrong, you just transgress. Because you, there's a difference between sinning with understanding and sinning without understanding. And sinning with understanding, that's what David said, forgive me of my presumptuous sins. The ones that I knew I was doing wrong and I did it anyway. And then after I did it, I said, Oh, God, forgive me. And we're going to talk about that because we talked about that in our members, there is the motions of sins. The motions of sins, that is that strong passion. The passions that come with sin. That when the devil puts it in front of you, this passion gets on you. Like, I got I to gotta do that. I got to do that. I got to do that. But as soon as you do it, the passion lifts. And then you're like, why did I do that? Somebody say amen. amen. It's like, but it's like it, it almost takes control because it's the, it's sin that's trying to reign in our members. But we're not functioning from the strength of a transformed mind. We're functioning from the strength of the old man, the flesh. And there are emotions tied to that flesh where that flesh says, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. The spirit says, don't do that. And the flesh says, well, you haven't been praying, spirit. The flesh says, listen, you've been watching movies about this? Come on. You've been watching, you're, you're, on, you're on season seven. <laughs> Flesh said, listen, you're on season seven. You've been feeding me for months. And spirit, you ain't been praying. You ain't, you, you ain't been praying, so guess who's strong here? We're going to do what I want. Right? But when we feed the Spirit the things of God and we are constantly meditating on the Word, right? Meditating on the Lord day and night, meditating on the Word, living according to the Word, when we're meditating on that, then what happens is the default is no longer the flesh, but the default is now the spirit. 
Now my response is a spiritual response because this is what I've been feeding. That doesn't mean you're exempt from the fight. What it means is now you have, you have been equipped to win the war. Amen. It's the difference between, you know, you having like a big sword because you've been feeding the spirit and so you just cut that thing down. But some of us have the sword the size of a pencil. Look at that. No prayer, no scriptures, no. And you're dealing with the big devil. And you're like, I don't know why God don't work. I don't know why God don't work. Devil just laughing like, I don't know. But if we feed that spiritual man, we're able to overcome and live a victorious life. Because obedience doesn't come, this is going to help somebody here, doesn't come from the strength of our flesh or our ability. Obedience comes from his grace empowering us to live for him. Amen. Amen. So th through the law came revelation. He says that I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of conspicuance. For without the law, sin was dead. Meaning that sin wasn't known to be sin until the law came. And what the law did was expose how sinful this flesh is. It, it, ex, it exposes. It's easy to say, well, if you don't know that it's a sin to, it's that, that it's a sin to, to covet, you may be sinning, but you're doing it unconsciously. So therefore, if you're doing it unconsciously, you don't have the condemnation that goes with the sin. But once you hear the law and says, hey, thou shalt not covet. Now when that covet nature starts creeping on you, number it exposes, hey, you got sin in you. And that's not fun to know you got sin. That's not what you want to hear every day, right? But it exposes, hey, there's sin in you, and, and when sin is exposed, sin takes advantage or occasion. It says you can't stop this. And it tries to reign in your members where you know it's wrong. But sin says, man, I'm just going to do my thing. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. This commandment, these 613 laws in the Old Testament, this was for life. This was like, hey, you got a relationship with God. Hey, this is how you get God's presence here. Hey, this is how it happens. And it was ordained to, for life. So God could be among them that they might live. Whew. But what happened is, because of my sinful nature... This law became death to me. Because now every day I wake up and I say, ah, oh, I missed it again. Ah, I did it again. Ah, ah, I'm trying to obey, but this struggle, it's you wake up in a fight. And what happens is the law, the enemy uses the law to keep you under a spirit of condemnation. And we're going to talk about it next week, Romans 8, 1, that, that there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. 
Meaning, condemnation does not originate in Christ. Wow. And many of you get used to walking under that guilt. Guilt is your best friend. You're not even lonely because you're carrying guilt with you everywhere you go. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And, and watch this. I'm about, to give, I'm about to ask you a rhetorical question. Has guilt helped you serve God? What does it do? It stops you in your tracks. And you say, why try? Right? Because what the flesh and what the devil wants you to believe is that everything is on your shoulders for your obedience. That, that it's you that's no good. It's you that have an issue. And you are the only one. And so you come to church and there is guilt and condemnation over you where you cannot receive the word of God because you only receive it as death into your spirit because it's another reminder of something that you're not doing right. That is the devil and that is your flesh trying to keep you from the presence of God. But if you can run to the cross, if you can run to his presence, and if you can say, there's no power within me, this is all in him, he has to help me. Amen. With condemnation comes no progress. You beat yourself up, I didn't pray today, I didn't pray. Well, how does that help you? I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I disobeyed again, I didn't, okay, but... What fruit is coming out of that condemnation? Only death comes out of it. Only death. Someone say only death. Only death comes out of that mentality. I remember whenever, uh, when I first started doing a lot of my um, keeping track of my devotion, um, I remember... I would get down on myself for not praying a certain amount of time and for not reading a certain amount of chapters. I would get down on myself, and I noticed the more I got down on myself, the less I prayed. Uh, and the more I got down on myself, the less I read. And the more I beat myself up, the more it was pulling me away from God's presence. And God said, the problem is that you think that my love is based on how well you perform. I unconditionally love you. Now, in your persuade, you being persuaded of that love will produ help produce proper fruit. So when I missed a day of prayer or missed a day of study, I, instead of beating myself up, I started saying, you know what, I'll do better tomorrow. You know what? I'll do better tomorrow. You know what? I'm going to do better. And once I started moving like that with the positivity, my prayer increased. My study increased. Come on, somebody. Because, because why? I'm not doing this for some performance thing. I'm doing this because I love him. Are you getting it? And, and if I'm going to do anything right in my life, it originates in him. So what I'm going to do is thank him for working with me. Oh, my. I'm going to thank him for working with me. Because my, I didn't, if you didn't purchase your own salvation, how in the world can, do you think you can live for him on your own merit? He's the author and the finisher of your faith. So he's the God of the beginning and the God of the end and the God in between. So how you started this journey, that's how you're, he, he's going to keep this journey. He began a good work. He himself is going to perform that good work. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? We cannot do it in the flesh. We cannot do it on our own accord. But we have to say, God, I need you to help me to have these spiritual characteristics. I need you to help me to get up in the morning to pray. I need you to help me to open up my Bible and read. I need you to help me. This is on you. This is your word. You gave me your spirit. And I need that spirit to help me right now. Amen. Okay, watch this. And so 
For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So I talked about sinning without a consciousness. It's, 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 it's like you being raised in another country and, and the speed limit is 80 miles per hour and then you move to uh, America and you're on East Colonial and it says you're supposed to go 45 miles per hour. So, but you come and all of a sudden you're doing 80 in a 45. Now, now, you don't know it's wrong until the law pulls you over. And then the law says, hey, you're doing almost double over the speed limit. That is really bad. This is what Paul is saying. He said, yes, there were unconscious sins. There were sins that you didn't understand without the law. But the law made sin appear watch this, and make it appear exceeding sinful. That it's actually really bad, so bad that we can't even handle it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I, I not. But what I hate, that do I. Isn't that Christianity in a nutshell? You ever left the per you ever left the church service and said, Man, I'm about to go on a seven-day fast. Pa Pastor minister, I'm about to go on a seven-day fast. And that's what I want to do. Service over <laughs> at by one o'clock. By 3 o'clock, you're eating potatoes on the couch. <laughs> eating Pringles. <laughs> and what do you say? I'm going to try next week. <laughs> One month passes. I'm going to try next week. One month passes. I'm going to try next week. Here it goes. New Year's resolution time. I'm a really, re you don't even believe yourself. You know, some of us don't even make resolutions no more. <laughs> we don't broke so many resolutions, we don't even make them no more. What's your New Year's resolution? I'm just, I'm just happy. Just, just, <laughs> I'm just happy. All right? Because... There is a competing war between the flesh and the transformation that's taking place in the mind. That's the issue. The mind is the issue. The issue is you got saved, but your mind is catching up. And when you've been in 19 years of dysfunction, come on somebody. 25 years of dysfunction and even after you got saved in, in all in the state they're saved dysfunction that, now that's now that's a tough thing to get through when you got family that's saved and they dysfunctional so you, you kind of weed out the <laughs> right it's dysfunctional it's like being raised in a, in a, in a family where everybody's saved, everybody's been saved for 10 years, but the, and, and mama's, mama's involved, but mama cussed the family out all the time at home. That, so a child is, is learning cuss words at five years old and four years old, and they're raising it so normal, right, that they don't know that there have been imprints on their mind. That now when they get out of the home, these things have become habits. 
while saved. Cursing just rolls off the tongue. I'm just using cursing as, a, as an example, but this could go into many other examples. Cursing just runs off the tongue because it's the nature, it's habit. There's nothing wrong with that. You hear what I'm saying? And so it takes a process for God to start transforming that mind out of the mind of just how they were raised or just how what was put in them and the habits that they picked up from family. But the process of a mind being transformed, detached from the sinful nature of what was and now enlightened to walk in the glory and the power of God with victory. That's a process. That's a process. And if you were in that for 19 years, God is able to heal everything in a day but sometimes it could take 5 to 10 to 20 years. The process. Because what happens, it's the, it's the onion. God deals with, hey, I want you to deal with that. And you say, okay, God, I give you that. God's like, okay. And you're like, whew, I'm glad I got free of that. And then a few months go by and God's like, oh, yeah, here's another layer. And okay, God, I give you that. And each layer, isn't it? Each layer is harder. It's like when you first come to God, is that first layer? God, I give it to you. Woo, that came off so quick. But then he starts dealing with the deep seated, deep rooted. Come on, are you getting it? The deep stuff. And that takes a transformed mind. He said, it's the law of my mind. My members, my flesh, wars against what I know about God. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He said it reaches a point where I give in to so much in the flesh that I lose my identity and I become that sin. Where it's just my, it's just my nature. It's not even without even thinking anymore. You see that? It's like he says, no more I that do it. It's almost like uh, it's almost like another realm of being given over to an activity that is just so second nature. People did this with, you know, uh, narcotics, with drugs, with, with smoking. And it, they're so they don't know what their life was like without those things. Where you start, where they start being identified by these things. Because you can never, you never see that person without smoking. You never see that person without drinking. You never see that person, come on, without, without a woman. You never see that person without a man. You never see that person. Are you getting what I'm saying? They become identified by the sin. Why? Because that's what, uh-oh, I just went hollow. Amen. Why? Because I just went so much given over to it that I don't know how I look without it. Can I give somebody a revelation? Everybody here, you have yet to meet the healed version of you. Oh, somebody clap right there. I'm helping right now. You have yet to meet the healed version of you. Because when you have been in the flesh and been impacted by sin and you identify yourself by certain traits, All you know about yourself is being broken. But you've accepted that as your personality. 
yeah, I don't really trust people real, real well. And you think that's your personality. That's not your personality. Something happened to you. Are you getting it? And what happens when something happens to you? And nobody knows about it. What do you do? You go into your little cave. And it's in the cave that sin likes to take you in that isolation. My Lord. When you are forced, and this is what they talk about with trauma, as a child, when you are deal with something and then you are sent to go into a room by yourself after you've been whipped or after you've been slapped or whatever it is, but you go, they say, now go to that place, go to that closet, go to that, and you, they go alone. Now the child is there with no understanding of why it's there and no parent to pat them on the back and hug them and embrace them and say, hey, everything's okay. They're forced to make sense of what's happening by themselves. And that's where they develop mentalities, lack of trust. Come on. Im impulses. And what God does is he comes in and he wants to start transforming the mind to not see yourself through the pain of yesterday, not see yourself through what others may have said about you, good or bad, mom and dad, whoever it is. But now you begin to see yourself through the lens of the scriptures. You begin to see yourself through the lens of God's presence. And now your identity is not because of what happened to you yesterday, but my identity is in the book. My identity is in his word. And he said, I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. He said that he loves me unconditionally. He says that I was worth dying for. So I'm not going to see myself through how I was rejected. Come on, by how I grew up. But I'm going to see myself by how I'm accepted in the beloved, in the scriptures. And when you start getting that, that's where your mind starts being transformed because if you see yourself by what happened, you're going to walk with this weight and this condemnation and this pain and, and the flesh just glories in that. And the flesh start, likes using that. Hey, you're depressed. Why don't you smoke this? Hey, you're depressed. Why don't you get in that relationship and that relationship? Why don't you sleep with that person? Why don't you do that? Why don't you lie here? Why don't you steal here? The flesh starts trying. The sin starts reigning in the flesh to start doing things that, that will not help the body later, but it appeases the motions of sin now. Flesh is a terrible substitute. Sin is a terrible substitute for the pure pleasure that is in the presence of God. There are things that only God can give you. There are things that only God can give you. There is hope. There is peace. There is joy that only God can give. Remember, remember what I read? Remember what I read when he said, oh, here, where is it? And in and, and Romans 6, 21, it said, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. And remember this Greek word ashamed? It literally means you believe the big lie. And you misaligned, you aligned with the lie. And he said, what fruit do you have in those things in which now you're ashamed? What was he talking about? He was talking about sin. He was saying, where's the fruit? Sin promised you so much. And you misaligned, you aligned with the big lie. And you, 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 sold, you sold everything. You put all your eggs in this big lie. And Paul is asking what fruit have you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? He said, now you're ashamed. You're ashamed that you believed that sin would do that for you. Because sin says, hey, man, just, just go to that person. Hey, man, just do this. Hey, man, hey, man, just steal this. Hey, man, and, and this appeasement. But all that came forth, what was it? Condemnation and death. 
And what? Now what? You feel distance. That's all. They, that, that's all. That's the only fruit you got. Distance. Condemnation. A path of destruction. That's all, that's all you got. But sin makes it look so good. You're going to get that. You're going to get that. And it's going to be that. But immediately when it's over, it's like, okay, I messed up. And that's if we have the courage. And, now, 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 and that's, if, that's if we have, as they taught about repentance in the earlier session, that's if we have the humility to say, I repent. That's the lost art of Christianity, repentance. Because we have to continue on. No, no. They go, you know, people go, I'm going deeper in the lie and deeper in the lie and deeper in the lie and deeper in the sin until there's joy somewhere. But the mind, and you know that conviction in you. When you start walking in a path that you know is wrong, the voice of your spirit starts getting smaller and smaller where you don't even hear it anymore. And that, what does that do? You get what we talk about in Romans 1, a reprobate mind. You can't be wrong. Ooh, that's a scary place to be. When you can't be wrong, listen, I try to, I live in a life of repentance. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the first people that will say, I'm sorry, forgive me. Especially if it means mending a relationship. But, and that's God's grace. That's nothing. In my flesh, there's no good thing. Amen? That's God's grace. But I want to live under that grace. But Paul identifies the battle in verse 18. For I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no, somebody say no, good thing. That's humbling. To say there's nothing good in me. Whew. You only know that when you see where the flesh can take you. Like I said, I remember whenever I, I was in the world and I could not stop cussing. You know, and it was one of those things where, where you know, God's hand was on my life. And so I didn't even sound right cussing. Like my cussing was like proper. I was cursing. <laughs> and I would say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God, forgive me. God. And, and because my flesh couldn't stop, that's when I resorted to Google. I said, Google, is cussing a sin? He says, yes, 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 maybe. Huh, I want to explore that article. <laughs> hmm. Someone says, no. Ooh, I like this one. <laughs> it's written by Rashir Jabbat. <laughs> Who has no profile photo. Oh, I like, you know, the flesh says, oh, I like this deception. Because wh wh why? Why? I want to be deceived so I won't feel guilty to keep doing what I'm doing. But that's when the Holy Ghost says, hey, you're off. And that's the war. Because with the mind, the mind saying stop and the body saying I can't stop. Mind saying stop, the body saying can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> that was one of the things when I when I used to first, and so I, I couldn't stop stop cussing. And so I started researching all this, and it wasn't until I allowed, I, I received the Holy Ghost, and I allowed God's Spirit to convict me over it. That when I messed up, 
after being saved, I said, God, forgive me. And when you first get the Holy Ghost, it's like that conviction hits you immediately. You, you watching Pinocchio getting convicted. God, don't ever let my nose grow like that, Lord. <laughs> but what, after you've been around church for a while, what happens? The Holy Ghost is almost like if you're not keeping that active, it becomes more faint. And if we start doing actions, ignoring the conviction, that is what can lead us into a reprobate mind, especially when you start justifying the sin. Ooh, that's dangerous. At least get convicted and repent and say, God, forgive me. But when you start justifying, well, I did it because you. God, I sinned because you didn't answer my prayer. What's up? People do that with God. People do that with God. They start justifying it. Well, I did it, God. Well, if you'd have came through sooner for me. I did it because, because they did this to me. And that's where, that's where you get into that, uh, that root of bitterness where you start justifying. Well, I, I, yeah, yeah, I'm sinning, but they sinned one time against me. So I'm kind of like getting equal because their sin was like seven times greater than my little sin. So I got to do my little sin like seven times to catch up. I said, you need a you need a renewed mind. Your your mind, you got to get a renewed mind. You got to start getting it back into the book. Because in our flesh there dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. He says, I keep looking for the answer to my problem. I keep knowing what to do right, but I can't perform. The good. And I keep looking to this book, How to Stop Sinning 101. I look to this book, How to Live and Overcome in Life. I look at this book and nothing is working. I find not. That means I'm searching for all of these other things to find a way to stop. Right? Here it is. For the good that I, I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, this is Paul the Apostle confessing that this struggle, that now I'm struggling so much, I'm doing evil. Now, in Western culture, we don't really use that word, evil. But let me tell you something. There are some evil stuff. Evil people. And even us have the capacity to do evil. When you look at the Hebrew word for evil, it's, it's very close to the word sorrow. That there is a, 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 a sorrow. That there is evil. That there's sorrow. There's shame. It's all of that that's tied, yoked into evil. Okay, let me get into this. Watch this. Um, I find then a law that is present with me. Oh, look, I like it in verse, verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And so what he's saying here is when I want to do good, evil is already waiting on me. That's why Jesus said, sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. Evil is already waiting on us. So we don't need to be so worried about tomorrow. That's putting extra evil on us today. We can only handle today's evil. I don't want to deal with me tomorrow. I'm busy dealing with me today. Oh, 
my. Are you getting what I'm saying? It's a wrestling match with me today. I don't want to bring that on me today. He said, listen, even when I want to do good, evil's present. The flesh is waiting. Look, this is what, this is what the flesh be doing after, after altar call. After, while you speaking in tongues and praying, look, flesh be like that. I'm, I'm, he gonna come to me soon. That's why we gotta walk in the spirit so we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Neither give place to the devil. And, and even the writer says in, in Corinthians that, that be not ignorant of Satan's devices. And what he was speaking there was, it was unforgiveness. Ooh, that's a device. When somebody hurts you, Satan's looking for a window. Got you. Neither give place to the devil. I'm forgiven quickly. Because if I start marinating on it, come on, somebody. We, be, we, we turn into Sherlock Holmes. Oh, my God. When we try to find out if somebody did us wrong, we go into Sherlock Holmes mode. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, they kind of uh, blinked two times uh, with the left eye. And I read on Google that that means they hate you. And 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 turning to Sherlock. I mean, we're looking for clues. It's blues clues. We start marinating on it. We're looking at we're looking at the shoes they're wearing. Oh, they're wearing black shoes today, huh? Because if you want to fight, that's what it's gonna be. There, there's the videos going out about the black air forces. Like, like if you want to fight somebody with white air forces, like you good, you gonna win. But if they got them black air forces on, <laughs> if you got them black air forces on, <laughs> said those are the guys that be like they walk towards you and they're like. Like, I ain't messing. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, bud. I for, forgive me. I, uh, I, I, I underestimated you. <laughs> Turn into Sherlock Holmes when it comes to holding grudges, and we'll look for clues that there's still. And 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 church folk can say, I, I, I forgive you, but I'm watching you. We're Sherlock Holmes when it comes with other people's sins. We're babes when it comes to our own sins. They're like, hey, man, you did that sin. Like, huh? Goo goo gaga? <laughs> yeah, you just committed a sin against me. They commit a sin against you. It's like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I found the trail. Come on, somebody. Somebody clap right now. That's, that's, that's facts. Okay. Okay. Here, here, here it is, me. Here, here it is. He said, he said, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. It's my inward man that wants God's law. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Look at the three laws he mentions here. He says, the four laws. He says, I delight in the law of God. I see another law in my members which wars against the law of my mind and it brings me into captivity to the law of sin. The law of God, the law of the members, the law of the mind, and the law of sin. When you delight in the law of God after the inward man, it's your spirit man that delights. 
But as you delight in the law of God after the inward man, this inner man, this spiritual man, it begins to marinate in the soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And after you get God's law in your, in your inner man, and after you desire it, it starts working on the mind, the will, and the emotions, which will empower you to overcome the law of your flesh, the law of your members, uh, so you don't succumb to the law of sin. So that's why it's important to get a daily intake of the word of God, of the presence of God in prayer so it can strengthen this inner man to overwhelm your mind and your thought processes because when the flesh rises up the mind says I know where that's leading Ooh. and there's nothing the mind fears more than consequences oh are you getting it the mind says I feel the urge to commit this sin but number one, is this pleasing to God? Number two, I know the road that's taking me on. I'm good. I still feel the war and the urge, but what I know is delivering me. You, uh, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's not just the truth. It's the knowledge of truth. I know the truth. You shall know the truth. Amen. It's what I know. It's my mind. R remember, what, what hell wants to do is he wants to keep us, uh, he wants to rob us of our understanding. Of God and his word. The Bible says that when the seed was sowed on the wayside, that the birds, the fowls of the, of the air immediately came and took it. And he said, what does that mean? He says, it's those that receive the word but don't understand it. See, when you understand it, you keep it. Yeah, Just receiving it, you get it. But it's understanding how you keep it. Oh, my goodness. So it's, it's the mind that allows you to keep the things of God in you and guard it where you can walk it out. Yes, I feel the urge. Yes, I feel the passions. But you know what? I'm, the mind is, is saying, don't go there. The mind is saying, I'm going to serve the law of God. I have been transformed by the renewing of my mind. And look what he says in this struggle, verse 24. After all of this battle, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Number one, some, <clears throat> this can be interpreted two ways. Number one, the body of death. He's speaking of who shall deliver me of this, this dead body. Like I'm carrying around dead weight. Who shall deliver me from this carnal man? Other historians and theologians believe that he is alluding to the crime of a murderer that in Roman custom when someone murdered somebody, one of the penalties and the punishments that they would do is that the person that they murdered, they would tie that person to their back. And they would tie the person that they murdered to his back and over time, as he journeys, as they walk, the decaying body starts decaying his body. And it starts infecting him, where it is a slow death for him. And they called it the body of death. That's like how it is carrying flesh sometimes, huh? It's like, it's just eating me up. Watch this. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, so then, then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He said, who shall deliver me? And he answers the question, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. How am I delivered from this wretchedness? Jesus. He's going to work with me. He's going to help me. 
He's going to strengthen me. That is the answer. It's not, it's not, this is not any, anything that we do in this mortal body that can deliver us from this dilemma. He said, I thank my God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's how we get set free from the law and the chains of the law of sin. And what Paul is saying, though, even though there's that struggle, I don't get condemned. Why? Because in the law of my mind, I know that Jesus Christ is my only hope, my only answer. I'm, I'm not thinking I'm hopeless. I still have a Savior that died for me. I still have a Savior that paid the price for me. I still have, and I never lose that out of my mind. I never take on my sins as if it's on my nature, as if it's on my responsibility to get out of this sin problem. Woo! But when you're dealing with it for a while, what? We start thinking, well, Jesus just don't work. But it's still Jesus. We just need to allow Jesus to work in us. Somebody say work in us. We need to allow Jesus to just work in us because he is still the way of escape. Can you clap your hands to the Lord right now? Come on, can you clap your hands one more time as you stand to your feet? Can you clap your hands one more time? So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with my flesh, the law of sin. We need to continue to think on things whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is holy, whatsoever is righteous. We need to think on the things of God and say, God, protect my mind. Somebody say, protect my mind. Because no matter if I fall, if I can just keep my mind on him, I'm going to serve the laws of God. Wherever the mind goes, that's where the body goes. And the flesh, Satan works through your flesh to impact your mind. God works through your spirit to impact your mind and your flesh. The enemy wants to work from the flesh to the mind, will, the emotions into your spirit. God wants to work through your spirit, mind, will, emotions into your flesh where the flesh is subject to what's in the mind. But that takes a lot of marinating on his word. Father, everybody's in a process, right? Everybody's on a journey, and we feel like we're not where we need to be yet. We're always aiming, right, to draw closer to him. That's a lifetime journey. That's the powerful thing. I've said it before. It's easier to be an apostle than it is to be like Jesus. Why? Because the apostles were imperfect men. It's like I said, the apostles weren't trying to be apostles. They were trying to be like Jesus. And while they were trying to be like Jesus, they became apostles. So it's easier to be a prophet than to be like him. See, the prophets were imperfect. He is the only one that's ever walked this earth that's perfect. That's why he's our aim. And that's going to keep you on the journey. That's going to keep you checking yourself. That's going to, right? We're all on that journey. So when we say pray, fast, open up the Bible, when we say those things, we're saying that so we can get your mind transformed where you don't go to the default mindset, but you go into the Word of God and the spirit mindset, which is going to lead to transformation and free from that condemnation. Amen? But when we're not in that, how many of you know it's like, it's like, it's like missing six months at the gym. Come on. And then, and then you try to go on the basketball court and dunk on somebody. 
your, your leg's going to be shot. Come on, you're going to tear your ACL. Come, come on, somebody. And, and, and that's what it is when God, what happens when God says, hey, I want you to do this. And you're going to be like, uh, I haven't been praying. I haven't been. This is going to hurt. But when you're in the spirit, God says, I, I need you to do that. You're like, I've been waiting on this. I'm spiritually in shape. Amen? Amen. So let's commit to that together, to open up his word more and allowing him to help us to transform our minds while we're on the journey. You are on the journey. It's not a journey of perfection. It's imperfection, pursuing perfection. And in that process, transformation and sanctification will happen. Can you lift up your hands right now? God, I thank you for your people. I thank you for this journey. I thank you for this opportunity. God, thank you for your patience with us and your love for us. God, transform our minds. I'm speaking to transform minds, God, by your spirit, not the flesh, by the things of the word of God, not the things of the world. We're not going to allow the trauma or the pain of yesterday to dictate our decisions, but we're going to allow the word and the spirit to help us and to guide us to walk with you, O oh Lord, in victory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Can you clap?